Come all who are thirst for the living God. Come and be refreshed. Come and be sustained. Come and be blessed. Amen. I do welcome you all to our Sunday service. And uh, I just want to say thank you for managing to listen, managing to uh, understand together what God is saying to us as we worship him, bringing all our faith together. It's really great because we, we find what God is saying to us and to, we discover what God is saying to us. Uh, and God reveals what he wants to us through his sermon, through his, his prayers and through other things. So I, I do want to thank you for really managing to listen to the message. Let us pray. We come to you, eternal God, with our faith and our doubt, our strength and our weakness, our courage and our fear, our failures and success. We come to you to be refreshed and cleansed. We come to you in Jesus' name. Amen. I will call Brother Ben to come and read the word of God from the book of Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 to 7. Okay. Uh, good morning, family, and it's great to be here again. I hope your week's uh, really, really good and you're enjoying this lovely weather. Um, as Johnson mentioned, I'll be reading from Exodus 17, 1 to 7, and it's about the water from the rock. So the whole Israelite community set out from the desert of sin, travelling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarrelled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses replied, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. They said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, What am I to do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord answered Moses, Go out in front of the people, take with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will stand there before you by the rock of Horeb, Strike the rock, and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called that place Massa and Marib Mer <laughs> Meribah, because the Israelites quarrelled and because they tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? And uh, this is the word of the Lord. Uh, awesome scripture. So uh, we'll get Johnson back to share his message for this week. Um, thanks, Johnson. Can't wait. You know what? <clears throat> God meets us, uh, the Israelites, in the gushing of the water from a desert spring. And God meets a Samaritan woman by a well in the heat of the day. God meets us in the everyday meeting places of shops and playgrounds. Come to encounter God this morning. Come to encounter one another. Come to encounter yourself. Amen. My thing today is, is the Lord among us or not? Is the Lord among us or not? That is the last verse. Is the Lord among us or not? Can the story of an event which occurred almost 3,000 years ago, have anything meaningful or significant to say to us in our contemporary human situation. The exodus of the people of Israel out of enslavement in Egypt happened that long ago. It is a story with which most of us are familiar. Our lesson is part of that story. In the lesson, we find the people of Israel somewhere in the desert Wilderness of Negev or Sinai, area of the southern part of Israel, or on their journey towards the promised land. It is only a short time prior to their receiving the Ten Commandments. 
So the scene is familiar one. They are in the desert and in need of water. The people of Israel began to grumble, to murmur, and questioning the faithfulness of God and the leadership of Moses. Is the Lord among us or not? They asked. Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us, our children, and our cattle with thirst? Moses turned to the Lord and said, What shall I do with these people? I have been in the Negev Desert of southern Israel in 1994 as part of my theological studies. Fortunately, I was in an air-conditioned car. But as I looked out and saw the wilderness, I wondered what would I do if something happened to the car and we had to start walking to help ourselves, for help. Would we be able to find a well or a spring before we died of thirst? The fear of thirst in a dry land is real, not imaginary, and caused the Israelites anxiety in their journey. I have not spent a great deal of time in a desert, so I really do not know how that might feel. Yet I believe there are other wildernesses in which we find ourselves, in which our needs are equally as great, though not for water. Our anxiety is just as intense when we ask the question, is the Lord among us or not? Is the Lord among us or not? Whatever the wilderness, whether it be a literal jungle or a desert, or an emotional, financial, mental, religious or relational wilderness, in the midst of those ex experiences, one of the things we learn is that life is a precocious event. It does not always stay the same. There are cries, crises in it. So before we evaluate the wilderness behavior too, Ashley, consider what it's like for you in your own wilderness. What is it like to be discouraged and depressed? What is it like to have a, a dream dashed to pieces on the rocks of disappointment? What is it like to have your hopes raised high only to plummet into the depths of despair? To be misunderstood by friends and family. To be blamed for something you didn't do by your teacher at school or your boss at work. Does it ever seem like no matter how hard you try to adjust to a new situation, the same problems arise and the same mistakes persist? How do you handle times of doubt and drought, spiritual dryness and thirst? How do you cope with the complaints of other wilderness travelers and being blamed then for their own dust spirits and depleted energy. Is the Lord in your place or not? Many times I've heard persons in mental anguish or illness describe their wilderness. Others in terminal illness speak of how they feel, bewildered by what is going on. Not knowing where they are going, what is going to happen to them, or to whom they might turn, they've asked it. Is the Lord among us? Grief is lonely and deep depression is frightening. And we wonder, is the Lord among us? So the question arising from the ancient experience of the Exodus is still contemporary concern. In the human condition in which we find ourselves, we want to know, is the Lord among us or not? You know, of course, as a preacher of the faith, what my answer is going to be? It is going to be the same as Moses. God is faithful. In the midst of this chaos, God is there. At times, the path which we had led us into the wilderness is the path we have chosen ourselves. And at times, it is the path someone else has chosen for us. We have been unwilling to follow. In any case, the net result is the same. We find ourselves in the midst of the wilderness asking in bewilderment, is the Lord among us or not? So a member of our church shared with me his story of putting up all his resources to join a partnership with another man. He did it in trust. It turned out that the man was dishonest. He had in fact put them in a position in which they lost all of their resources and had more debt than they could ever pay, repay. So the, the dishonest man left the town. 
My friend shared with me some of the emotions he felt in the tangle of finances, not knowing which way to turn or where to go. He prayed more than he had ever prayed in his whole life, wondering, is the Lord among us or not? That was the question. Another person shared the experience of wilderness relationship. She had been vulnerable and had become involved with another person who had not treated her with the same devotion that she had committed to the relationship. A lot of fighting in the house. A lot of fighting in the relationship. In the entanglement of emotions, she was wondering, how do I get out of this wilderness? Can the Lord help? First, let us consider why we ask the question. I believe we do so for two reasons. First, we ask the question because the crisis, the trials, the tests, the wilderness of life force to deal with the fact that we are and ultimately are not in control. We are not in control or in charge of our lives. And we come up against experiences in which we do not even know what to do. These are the challenges we face. For a while, it may appear that we are in control. Everything is beautiful. The path is clear. We are moving. Nothing can go wrong from us. In such experiences, many people question whether they have a need for God. When things are going on smooth, when things are going on well, everything is moving. Sometimes people think there's no need for God. But ultimately, life gives answer, the answer. Whatever the experience, when it comes, we have choices. We can be stubborn or resistant. We can insist that we can handle it ourselves and thus remain in our frustration or our confusion, our wilderness, claiming there's no exit, no way out. Or in faith, we can acknowledge our need and believe there's someone greater than we do, than us, who can and is able to help us. And that person is God. So behold, I stand before you. I stand at the door. If anyone hears my knock, and opens the door, I will come in and dine with that person. So God says to Moses, Behold, I stand before you. He said, When you are moving, when you have taken the elders as you are moving, you will see a rock. I will stand before you. So you are not on your own. The Lord is with you. Water will come. Moses believed that when the, when the Lord told him to go and did what the Lord told him to do, and the water was there. The people have refrained and they continued their journey towards the promised land. They found their answer. Water will come up. Moses believed that. Went where the Lord told him to go. And what is it? He finds the answer. So Jesus gave a new expression to this idea when he encountered the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well. He explained to her that there are two kinds of water. There is the water that quenches our physical thirst. But there is also another kind of water that I am going to give you. Refreshing to the water from the well, he said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water I shall give him will never thirst. And it will become in him a spring welling up into everlasting life. So the woman said, Say, give me that water. I need it. I need to drink. Moses and the people of Israel needed water to quench physical thirst, and the Lord provided it. The Samaritan woman needed something to refresh her life in its weariness, to give a reason for going on, the Lord provided. Each discovered that, as the psalmist said, God is the fountain of living water. So we ask our question out of need, out of an awareness that in the wilderness of life, there is still one who knows the way and can refresh us on our journey. And that is Jesus Christ. So the second reason we ask the question is because we need reassurance. To whom else can we turn in the wilderness? Who else is the water of life which can restore our bodies, refresh our spirits, and send us in on our way? Without the water of life, we perish, but with it, will live forever. It takes faith to believe that, to wait for its coming, to see it, and to acknowledge it when it comes, and to give thanks. Life is a mercurious venture. It does not always stay the same. 
we find ourselves in a wilderness of critical experiences. But that is not an indication of the absence of God. It is a reminder that there is one to whom we can turn, who can lead us to the promised land, or who to the promised life, who can help us. Once we have had that experience, one of the beautiful things about the discovery of the presence of God and the meaningful experience of faith is that we can demonstrate that faith works. God is with us. We are never, never alone. He's there with us. So, pay careful attention here. God did not give Moses a website full of effective methods for managing conflict. He did not give him to say, okay, you need to Google to find answers. No. Neither did God provide Moses with a list of snap replies that was still for complaining and eliminate blending. Instead, God gave Moses directions for how to find water. So the directions were given. Where is the water supply in your own wilderness right now? What guidance is God giving to you? Look again at the fifth and sixth verse in our text. Where God's guidance, Moses and to you, are familiar. Go for a walk with some wise, trusted Christian leaders. Bring with you a sign, a memory, a symbol of how God's presence was your guide through previous difficulties. And when you do this, God tells both Moses and you, I will be standing there in front of you. He will never leave you. He will be standing there. So it is in this dry wilderness times that God leads us to see flowing water. God leads us to the solid rock of ages, Jesus Christ, from who all blessings flow. God stands in front of us at the baptismal font, reminding us of God's own life giving, life changing, love that leads us through any wilderness with a love that never lets us go thirst. But it will encourage us. Here, in, your, in our congregation, in your own lives, there will be wilderness times of doubting and despairing, complaining and blaming, mourning and murmuring, grumbling and groaning. That's normal. That's even biblical. <laughs> because you find it in the Bible. As the Hebrews did, you often lose sight of God's presence with you and God's promise to you and for you. You will search desperately for the quick fix for your most recent and troublesome problems. You don't need to that, do that. There is someone who is there to help you. That too is normal and biblical. In fact, Moses gave names to the very place where this happened. He called the place Massa. Test. Meribah. Quarreling. Because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord in this place or not? On verse 7. So he gave those names. So, is the Lord in this place? Is the Lord in your place or not? If people big and blame, does that mean God is not there? If there's a pain and despair, hunger and thirst, does that mean that God is absent? If there's violence and oppression, or disease and depression, does that mean that God does not care? Is the Lord in this place or not? Grief is lonely. Depression is heavy. But when someone comes alongside and says, I will walk with you, you are not alone. We can experience the assurance of God's promise. I will never leave you. That love never dies. I ask you then, is the Lord among us or not? Being in worship is evidence of your faith. Coming here today is evidence of your faith. That the Lord is among us. Or that you want to believe he is. Being among us, God's presence is always for good. Yes, indeed, the Lord is in this place. All right, the Lord Jesus entered the dark abyss of the world. He suffered, bled, and died in this world for you and for all humankind. Where bodies are broken, Christ is there. Where blood is poured out, Christ is there. So Christ is there. Where souls are splashed with flowing water, Christ is there. Where God's word is spoken, Christ is there. Where God's people gather, Christ is there. Is there, Lord, 
in this place or not? Is the Lord in this place or not? Look around. God is showing you. Listen. God is telling you something. And all God's people say, Amen. Because God is present. He's present. He's among us. Don't doubt him. He's there. That's why I told Moses, when you go with the elders and you see the rock, I will be there. I will be there. So please, don't miss God's presence. God is with you. Is the Lord in your own house? Is the Lord in your own family or not? I believe he should be. He's part of your family. He's part of your Christian journey. So believe in him. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let us pray. We praise you, Lord. That when we make mistakes, the waters of your understanding cleanse us. When we are tired, the waters of your strength refresh us. When we are unsure, the waters of your ways direct us. When we are afraid, the waters of your love protect us. When we are alone, the waters of your presence surround us. We thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. Be with us, Father. We pray for all those who cry out for water to drink today. For those in places of violence, we pray for the outpouring of peace for those in places of poverty. We pray for the outpouring of abundance for those in places of wealth. We pray for the outpouring of generosity for those in places of despair. We pray for the outpouring of hope for those in places of COVID. We pray for the outpouring of healing. In all places, Lord, we pray for the outpouring of life in all its fullness. Amen. I would ask you to get your offering together. Bring your offering. Then we can pray together as you put your offering. You can use your electronic gadgets to send your offerings. Thank you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we come before you, as we come before the throne of God, knowing that you are there with us in whatever circumstance we face, you are there with us. You've given us the spirit of love, life. And today we are confessing that we are what we are because they've given us love, life. So we bring our offerings of thanksgiving, saying thank you, Lord, for the love you have shown to us. May you bless this offering so that it can be used for the expansion of your kingdom. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let us pray. Let us receive grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. May your words refresh those who are saved. May your deeds refresh those who are tired. May you continue on your Christian journey. May you know the refreshing love of God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. Amen.